Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Courtney. I'm here with my spouse, Royce, and together we are the Ace Couple. And hello, all of you new listeners. <laughs> I'd ask where you all came from, but I've got a sneaking suspicion that I know exactly uh, where, in fact, you came from. Uh, however, the fact of the matter is... There have been a tremendous number of you who have reached out to us, who have asked for sort of a, a basic ACE 101 overview. There are tons of you out there who are allosexual. That is the opposite of asexual. So it doesn't matter if you are straight, gay, bi. If you are sexual, you are part of the allosexual spectrum. Welcome. And lots of you have said, you know, I'm not ace or I am allo and I want to learn and be a good ally, but I am very, very, very new to all of this. So we've sort of deliberately over the last couple of years not done an Ace 101 episode because frankly, we're not Ace 101 people. We've been married almost a decade. We both knew we were asexual when we first met each other. We've been in and around a lot of pockets of the asexual community. And we care so much about the the nuances of asexuality, the intersections of asexuality and race or disability, neurodivergence, all these things um, that we feel are very under-discussed. But... Since there are so many of you who are brand new and have been asking, I think now is the time. And since my brain doesn't tend to like thinking of just the basic Ace 101 topics, I'm, I'm going to defer to Google on this. We're, we're going to answer Google autofill questions today. We're going to answer as many as we can and see how it goes. I'll, although I've, I've got a sneaking suspicion that almost every single one of the questions that Google's going to bring up for us, the answer is probably going to be, it depends. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of that, yeah. It depends. So is, is the formula going to be read a Google autocomplete question, give a like two word quick answer, and then give a lengthy extrapolation? <laughs> We're, we're gonna have to give the lengthy extrapolations, I feel. But we'll try to keep it terse enough that we can get through a lot of different questions. So I suppose it should come as no surprise that when I type in do asexuals into Google, uh, the, the very first question that pops up is do asexuals have sex? Are you going to say it depends? Say it with me, audience. It depends! <laughs> See, the, this this was my fear about doing Ace 101 things, because it, it, the, the answer is always going to be it depends. Yeah, some do, some don't. <laughs> Those who do have a variety of different reasons for why they might. I guess the first thing to point out is that being asexual or being a part of the broader A-spec umbrella could be sex repulsed, meaning... I mean, let, let's let start with just our, our own sort of experiences, because you and I are in different areas of the asexual spectrum. I am very much on the sex repulsed side of things, so the, the idea of having sex is not a good thing. <laughs> it is quite frankly, is disgusting um, when I think about myself in those situations. It's, it's not to be conflated with sex negative, because I'm not saying like, all sex is bad, you shouldn't have it, the very like puritanical concept. And sometimes that's a big misunderstanding that people outside of our community might hear like, oh, you're sex repulsed. Like, why are you such a prude? Why do you hate sex? Why are you homophobic? Like, those are things that you will hear, but it's like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not applying this to you. I'm saying in my experience, it's not doing it for me. I do not want to. So, so that is like a far end of the spectrum and, and not all aces are sex repulsed, but then there are aces that are just sort of neutral about it. Like I could take it or I could leave it. And then what really confuses some folks outside of the community is that there, there are actually sex favorable aces who do enjoy engaging in sexual activities and that enjoyment can come from a variety of different places. It might be that physically speaking, the sexual act just feels good, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're attracted to the person they're engaging in this with. Or it could be a little more psychological, like I am in a partnership and I enjoy 
helping my partner to feel good. And so even though it's not necessarily doing anything for me, it's still an enjoyable act because I like seeing my partner happy and my partner satisfied. So those those are just, you know, some examples here. But like, Royce, you're you're not repulsed like I am. So what's your sort of experience that would differ from a sex repulse days to give people a little personal frame of reference? Well, you mentioned drawing a line between the idea of being sex negative or just kind of against the idea or the concept of people out in the world having sex and being repulsed, uh, which sex repulsed, I think, is a very carefully chosen word. Like, repulsed has meaning. You you said it's disgusting was the word that you used. Mm -hmm. I'm... Some people will also use averse. Cause averse some, is a good one, too. Some aces will say, like, I don't literally find it repulsive, but I am absolutely not going to willingly engage in this of my own volition sort of a thing. So they might use the word, I'm sex averse. But some, some people might use averse and repulsed interchangeably. It's just, that's the case-to-case -case basis where if you are very good friends with an individual ace person or if you're engaging in some sort of partnership with an ace person, that's just sort of... Of the personal nuances that you're going to have to learn on a case-by-case -case basis. Compared to that, I'm very indifferent to a lot of aspects of sex. There isn't anything about it that particularly bothers me. I don't. I think if I were to sit down with an aloe person and really talk about, like, really get into the intricacies of personal experience, I think that there is something that aloe people experience that I don't experience. In my case, I think there are some times where the the concept of having, like, for example, an aloe partner who does get some enjoyment out of sex, being able to be a part of that experience, being able to provide something for them in some way is fulfilling in a way, but not in a special way that is any different than, you know, any other activity we, we could be doing together, for example. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's also a part of it that I think to me is, as someone who is neurodivergent on the autism spectrum, the more I've thought about it for me, like the way that I've interacted with people in the past, it's various forms of stimulation can be kind of like stimming, a, a type of stimming. There's something enjoyable about, you know, some physical feelings that is, is not the same as an, as what an allosexual person is getting out of sex, but it can be nice every now and then. Yeah, we, I mean, you and I have had this conversation. I don't know how in-depth we've gotten on microphone about it yet, but we have talked about like how some elements of kink could function more as heavy stimming for an individual person on a case-by-case -case basis as opposed to something that is inherently sexual. Because we have spoken about how there are some asexual people who are very into kink, and that can confuse a lot of people on the surface, because I think the common allo perception is that kink is inherently sexual. And to some people, it may be. There are allo kinky people out there that it, it is a form of sexual gratification to engage in kink. But it is not always the case for every kinkster, for every person who starts looking into kink as an area of interest. But there are so many dynamics if you're talking about, like like a dominant submissive situation, it might not involve genitals. It might not involve sex. It might be the power play and the power dynamic. It might be elements of role playing. If you're getting into sensory things like scratching, whipping, things like that, like it might not be sexual, but sometimes it does just feel good to get your back scratched, you know? And getting into areas of like sadomasochism like that can be sexual to some people it does not have to be and something that a lot of people in the asexual community are very good at is splitting out different elements of what does or does not make us tick you know we we might say you know my my sexual orientation and my romantic orientation aren't the same they don't align so therefore we're we're very tuned into the fine details of what we do and what we don't like. And we can say, you know, I do enjoy this element of kink, not because it's sexual, but because of this other element altogether. So that's just, 
a brief overview of some examples of that, I suppose. I, I'm not going to get into it now because this has to be its own episode. We've talked about making this its own episode and it'll, it'll come someday. <laughs> but because of the sex averse or sex favorable being kind of similar to sex negative or sex positive, there are a bunch of asexual people that are really afraid to get wires crossed there. So there's, you'll very often see when engaging in a spaces, people will make this hard line statement of I'm sex averse, not sex negative, or I'm sex repulsed, but I'm sex positive. Positive. And sometimes that can be the case. I've I've got I've got something that's maybe a hot take about the the term sex positive that we're we're gonna have to do a whole episode about because if I just give a little tiny bit, people are gonna get really angry without understanding what I'm saying about that phrase. <laughs> but I don't always think that that phrase uh, has actually historically been very kind to everyone in the A spectrum. So we'll, we'll leave that at there for now. But something you'll also run into a lot, if you follow a lot of ACE advocates, if you're looking up the sort of ACE 101 resources, there's a very common catchphrase that you'll hear where asexuality is about attraction, not action. And I unfortunately think that has sometimes gotten a little overused. It, it is, it, it rhymes, it's easy to whip out time and time again, so I see why it has caught on and why people say it as often as they do. And in some cases, contextually, it is very true and is helpful because the, the heart of what's trying to be conveyed there is asexuals can still have sex, but that doesn't define their asexuality. What defines their asexuality is that they are not attracted to. So the asexuality implies who are you attracted to, or in this case, not attracted to, versus what are you doing with those people? It's the attraction, not the action. And in certain instances, that can be a very, very affirming thing to people who are on the sex favorable side of this spectrum, because there are instances, and I'm not going to pretend that there haven't been, where people have been gatekept out of the community saying, like, you're not asexual enough because you love sex. <laughs> and that's when you start getting the really subversive people out here making tweets like, like I'm a, I'm a hypersexual, horny ace, and I love having sex. And you'll see tweets like that. Uh, we, we even covered uh, ContraPoints in our very first episode making a tweet about how confusing those tweets are. It wasn't a great look for her to do that and say that, <laughs> but that was what sort of started our conversation where, yeah, that's not contradictory to all ace experiences. And we don't want to gatekeep people. We aren't going to say you're less asexual because you have sex. And anyone who has experienced that has unfortunately met a very toxic side of the ace community or a very toxic pocket of the ace community. However, for me and where I am on the spectrum, being on the sex repulse, sex averse side of things, to me, I do see not enjoying sexual activities, not wanting to seek out sexual activities. I do see that as a very fundamental manifestation of my asexuality. And so when people take that train of thought too far, or they're really trying to drive a point home, people will say like, it has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you have sex. It has absolutely nothing to do with celibacy. It has nothing to do with abstinence, all of these things. I don't think that's the case for a lot of people. There are a lot of aces out there who not engaging in sex is a fundamentally important part of their own asexuality. And when I point that out, sometimes there are folks who are on the sex favorable side of things who will say like, well, by, by saying that you're invalidating my side of things. And it's a, it's a dance that we keep doing back and forth. It's, it's unfortunately sometimes gets very, very toxic, this sex repulse versus sex favorable aces. But I, I compare it to, other types of sexualities. I know, for example, let's take, let's take gay men as an example. <laughs> there are plenty of gay men out there who say that being a man having sex with another man is such an important part of their sexuality. 
And could you imagine going to someone like that and being like, that's not what makes you gay. It's that you're attracted to men. You having sex with men has nothing to do with your sexuality. That would be a very weird thing to say to someone, right? That would be a very weird thing to say. And of course, there are gay asexual people. So that might actually be true for them. It might actually be true for some people on a case-by-case -case basis. But making this flat definition that must apply to everyone's individual unique manifestation and then saying, well, no, you can't say that not liking sex is a part of your asexuality because that's not what asexuality means. It's like, it, it's what my asexuality means. I'm not saying it's everybody's, but that is what it is for me. So that's why I, I do fear that some of the Ace 101 lines that get thrown around so often are a little bit too reductive. And I think strategically they're important in some cases, but they absolutely do not tell the whole story. Since this is a 101 type episode, should we go ahead and extrapolate a little bit on the gay asexual? Sure, go for it. Just with that being the first question we've answered here, I didn't know if there might be any people out there who are new to this discussion who might be a little confused by that. But one term you'll hear thrown around a lot in this community is split attraction. And not everyone explains their orientation using this sort of you know, system, thought process, model, whatever you want to call it. But many aces do. I personally can see a clear difference between how I am emotionally or romantically attracted to people or the way that I maintain or manage those relationships and my sexual orientation. And in the same way here, you, you could have a man who is romantically involved with other men, but is also asexual. One way of saying that would be to say that they are homo-romantic asexual, gay ace, you'll see terms like that. Yeah, you'll see lesbian ace, you'll see bi ace, arrow ace for a romantic asexual, all sorts of things. And the split attraction model is important to know what it means and how it functions in vocabulary because so many aspec or a spectrum, meaning asexual and aromantic spectrums combined, so many aspec people do use it. So if you're going to be engaging in these conversations or observing these conversations, it's helpful to know but without turning this into an entire episode about the split attraction model, because that's coming later, <laughs> just know that while it is useful to know how it works and how to identify it, please don't treat it as a 100% given that all A specs are going to use it or that all A specs must use it, because not everybody does. And our, our intention is to have a more fleshed out series of episodes that will talk about what the split attraction model is, how it's used, talk about the positives of it, but also talk about the negatives of it, and then get really, really deep into complicated nuances that are honestly under-discussed even within A spec communities. But there's a little primer for now. Question two. <laughs> okay, Royce, I, I said every question here was probably going to be it depends, but this one is a very definitive answer. This might be the only one on the list where we can all 100% of us agree. Do asexuals like Chicago pizza? I'm going to abstain from answering that one. You can answer. No, of course we don't like Chicago pizza. No asexual like Chicago pizza. There has never been an ace alive, present or past, who has ever enjoyed a slice of Chicago pizza. That's a really fun fact about our community. In fact, that's the reason why we say aces like garlic bread so much, because when someone says, do you like Chicago pizza, we say, no, we'd rather have garlic bread. Too much sauce in Chicago pizza, really. Why, why make the dish deeper? There's no reason for that. Asexuals don't like it deep. We don't like it deep and we don't like it saucy. Next question. <laughs> Do asexuals kiss? That's going to be another it depends. Really anything of does this entire community of people do something? It's going to be, it's going to depend on that person's personal preferences. Yeah, every single question, except for Chicago pizza, of course. Right. And different people are going to have their own, their own lines, their own personal boundaries, much like the discussion we just had a moment ago about sex repulse, sex favorable, sex 
neutral. Some people may be uncomfortable kissing or really extend that to any form of physical contact. Personally, I can say that, I guess much like my answer before, there's nothing special about it. It's just an action. And... <laughs> And it's, it's not negative, it's not particularly positive. A big part of me finding my way to understanding my own asexuality has been slowly realizing that everything that society and all the people around me told me was not what I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. Like the, you're going to hit this milestone in your life, you're going to do this, this thing, and it's going to be great, and you're going to know the moment you've done that. The, the first time you kiss, the, you know, first time you have sex something like that it's going to reaffirm your relationship or you know, like be a a source of progress or like a milestone in that relationship there's the the idea that when you kiss someone you'll know whether or not you love them or not and the sparks of, the, 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 the sparks, butterflies right like none of that has ever happened for mm -hmm. me like that's that's not something that i experience and it took me a while to realize the difference between a relationship that like was or wasn't working and these social cues that were leading me in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Well, it's to even take the sex repulsed idea further, there are some people, asexual or otherwise, who are completely touch averse. And I honestly hear conversations of touch aversion a lot more often in neurodivergent communities than the asexual community itself which is probably an oversight on the asexual community itself because some some aces absolutely are completely touch averse so they aren't even interested in holding hands they aren't interested in kissing but then there are also some sex repulsed aces who say I'm not repulsed by kissing I might even like kissing but as soon as you know everyone has their own line and boundary just like allo people do aces might be crossed a little faster than average but I, I know some sex repulsed aces who say, like, I love kissing, but as soon as, like, people are naked and genitals are involved, no thank you. <laughs> so it, it's different for everyone. I know for me, I'm much more of a little peck kind of a person. Like, I, I have never understood the appeal of just, like, sitting and making out on a couch. It sounds so boring and horrible to me, and I don't understand it. And I knew from past relationships of mine with Aloe, people that, you know, people do like kissing, they do like making out. And I learned at one point, like, the only way I can really handle a kiss for any length of time is if teeth are involved. <laughs> like, a, like, if I could, like, bite someone else's lip, I'm like, this is kind of interesting. If we're just, like, lips and tongues and swapping, no, thank you. Which actually, I was so embarrassed, but the first time you ever kissed me, I just, like, bit your lower lip and I was like, oh god, we haven't talked about that. I am sorry, is that okay that I just bit your lower lip? <laughs> Because that was, for me, just like a reflex. I was like, okay, kissing is happening. Bite. <laughs> Time to bite. But, like, we as a couple, we we don't make out. We really don't even kiss on the lips all that often. Maybe once in a blue moon. But I honestly, as far as kisses, I think kisses on, like, the forehead or the neck. I think those are more interesting than lip-to-lip -lip kisses, personally. I'm not repulsed by most kissing in the same way. Although, I, I kind of, I guess I... I have complained about TV shows that have extended makeout scenes that are just very, like, too much saliva mouth sounds. That does really, really bother me. <laughs> but me personally, I'm, I'm not that repulsed by kissing, but if it turns into actual making out, it's, um, boring. And not good? Like, I'm not getting anything out of it. I second boring. I I feel like, in my experience, it's just never done anything to me. In past relationships with aloes, I've... Well, this might be more of just a, a like social anxiety response, but I've generally just been sitting there thinking, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I supposed <laughs> to be changing things here? Like, are they leading? Is the expectation on me? Like, like what is the, the plan here? Is this doing it for you? <laughs> well... Is this the appropriate amount of time? Are you waiting for me to switch <laughs> to something else? Like, what? we didn't discuss the, the rules here. 
Have you ever, I am astonished, I don't think I've ever asked you this before, but have you ever dated someone with like lip and tongue piercings? And was that ever an anxiety point for you the first time kissing that person? <laughs> um, an anxiety point? Like... I don't know, like, am I going to hurt you if I, oh. if I move this in the wrong angle or... You know, I don't actually remember. I've dated people with piercings. I think the only time where I was, like, concerned about, like, whether or not messing with a piercing would hurt someone were nipple piercings. Oh, nipple piercings. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Don't think I heard that story. But, uh, I mean, I, I, I have dated aloe people with, like, lip and tongue piercings, and after the initial, like how am I supposed to maneuver around this thing? Um, turns out, like, tongue piercings, that's, that's just a new thing to bite. Like, if you want to make out, I'm just going to bite your tongue piercing. Your tongue is mine now. I control it. <laughs> Got it! <laughs> Probably not uh, what, what they had in their head while trying to make out with me, but... <laughs> little insight into a very specific ace mind. <laughs> Question four. Do asexuals date? I'm halfway inclined to say no, because we didn't really date. We just kind of jumped right into we're life partners now. De <laughs> Define date. Because I, I was going to say, like, hi, h hello from two people branded as the ace couple. <laughs> yeah. See, this is another one where it's all personal preference. Some aces want to date and actively go out of their way to... The complicated nuance, because the, the simple answer is, well, some aces are also aromantic... But a romantic also kind of has the same, like, parallel vocabulary as I can still not be romantically attracted to you, but maybe I do still want to date or I do still want a partnership. Whether that be a queer platonic relationship is something you hear in A-spec communities quite a lot, where overall we just, we try to not establish a hierarchy of, like, romance is the pinnacle ultimate relationship that is above all the others. But there are arrow aces out there who are happily single, want to stay single their entire life, do not have any interest in dating. But there are even some arrow aces out there who do date or do engage in partnerships. So that's, again, something to just know that there's diversity and you're gonna have to go on a case-by-case -case basis when meeting a new person, whatever they willingly disclose to you, or if you're in a comfortable enough relationship close enough to them that you're able to ask. There's going to be diversity in the person themselves from a person-to-person -person basis and in the nature of relationships. One thing we occasionally talk about is how if you go back out to heteronormative land, there's like this hierarchy of relationships, mm -hmm. which ultimately always ends in a monogamous marriage with children. Which is romantic and sexual and, yeah, as you said, exclusive. And yes, and... Procreative. There are a lot of different kinds of meaningful relationships that a person can have, and they don't necessarily need to be sexual or romantic. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to talk about this at, at length in a future episode, but in, like, polyamorous communities, you'll hear the concept of, like, relationship anarchy. I think Aspects are the best relationship anarchists out there. <laughs> a lot of us are naturally wired toward at least some level of relationship anarchy. And that's sometimes whether or not we're even polyamorous or if we are monogamous. Like, Royce, you and I are monogamous, but not all Aspects are. In fact, like, when I met you, I had kind of given up on dating because I had gotten comfortable and safe and happy being alone. And there was also just a deep frustration in dating when nearly everyone who ever courted me was aloe. And with that came certain expectations that I wasn't too jazzed about. So when I sort of turned off any and all desire to date, that's when I found you and, and we got married. And as they say, the rest is history. So... Funny how that works out sometimes. But there are also, sadly, some asexual people who do want to date. They do want some type of relationship that dating might lead to, but are just afraid to do so or feel like they aren't allowed to do so because any, any romantic relationship would require sex or any monogamous relationship would require sex. And that can be really hard. It doesn't have to be that way, but... 
as someone who has been there and knows a lot of people who have been there, that is a very natural way to feel at certain points, but it's possible. And if that's you, I hope that you will find what it is that you are looking for and find happiness within it. All right. Well, the next question we pretty much already covered, but it says, do asexuals like kissing? So that's different because the first question was, do asexuals kiss? (laughs) But I think we covered whether or not they like it within answering that. So here's a, here's a goofy one though. I'm, I'm going to be curious to see what your uh, gut reaction is to this, Royce. Do asexuals feel lust? I mentioned earlier where it would be helpful for me to articulate some of these lines if I, like, sat down with an allosexual person and got into, like, very detailed descriptions of what we actually experience. Um, because that's that's where it's hard to find precisely, you know, where the difference is from person to person until you actually start talking about how you experience the world around you. And I would need a clear definition of lust. That's the thing. I, I literally just Googled the definition of lust because this is one of those words where I have 1000% been in a room full of ace people talking about like, what is lust? <laughs> because... Certainly not all aces, never, hashtag not all aces. But for a good number of us, we'll hear a word like lust and be like, what does that feel like? Do I know what that feels like? I don't think I know what that feels like. Well, a pretty common ace experience is being around a group of other people who are fawning over some attractive person, whether they are in person with them in their group or a famous actor or musician or something like that, and not getting it. Mm-hmm. Well, and the thing is too, and let's let's break this down definitionally. So in Googling the definition of lust, we have very strong sexual desire, but that's the noun. The verb like to lust is have a very strong sexual desire for someone. And I suppose my personal association is like it is directed at someone in particular, like you are lusting after the the, the very hot actor or this person you're attracted to or even your own partner or someone you want to be your own partner. And this is where the word desire gets so much more complicated when when we're in the ASPEC community too, because to make the it's about attraction, not action line even more complicated than it already is, there are concepts of attraction, like who are you sexually attracted to? There are some people who say sexual desire is distinctly different from sexual attraction. So they'll say, I might desire to have sex, not because I'm attracted to that person, but just because I want to have sex. So to those people, attraction and desire are two different things. But also for a lot of people, attraction and desire do go hand in hand. If you're attracted to someone, you do desire to do that activity with them. For me and my experience and my place on the A spectrum, I do not have the attraction, therefore I do not have the desire. To me, those two things are pretty much one and the same. But knowing that some people split them out... (laughs) I can extrapolate that there are certainly some aces out there who may feel a, quote, very strong sexual desire in whatever specific circumstance does it for them. And if they define that as lust, that's fine. That could be a thing. But I'm sure also some aces will read the the verb definition saying have a very strong sexual desire for someone. And they'll say like, well, if it's a very targeted at someone, then that does sound a lot like attraction. And so it's kind of, I don't know. I mean, everyone's kind of going to have their own associations with what that word means and what that feels like. And... That's when I'm just going to have to ask people on a case-by-case basis. If if an ace comes up and is like, I, I feel lust, I'd be like, all right, explain that to me. <laughs> what What is your experience with lust? What does that mean to you? And what does that look like in your experience? Because also like similar we have here to be consumed with desire for or to find sexually attractive or to find sexy. So I know there are tons of allos out there who are going to inherently think that lust requires sexual attraction. And maybe that alone is going to make certain aces say like, well, that's not what I'm feeling then. Yeah, my interpretation, my connotation for that word was much closer to sexual attraction. I hadn't really considered it being used as more of like another word for something like libido. Breaking out our pocket dictionary for words. (laughs) 
I, I, I see where you're going with that, because very strong sexual desire on its own, if that's how you're defining it and it's not directed anywhere, that does sound like it could have some overlaps with the definition of libido. And some aces have a libido, some aces don't. <laughs> Because then there's also, to add, how many wrenches have we added to this conversation already? And do we need a bigger toolkit? So <laughs> then there's arousal, which is like the physical stimulation, you know, the arousal, um, which some aces might feel arousal as a result of a particular act, but that doesn't mean that they felt lust or desire or attraction toward another person. But the arousal could still be a pleasurable thing. And it's, it's just complicated. <laughs> it's so very complicated. Because the, the thing is that I think a lot of allosexual people take for granted is that... A lot of people just sort of lump all these things in with another. They assume that, you know, lust and libido are going to be in line with attraction, are going to be in line with desire, and all of those things are what's going to cause the arousal, and it's all just sort of lumped into one package, and it all goes together. And so, like, a, I mean, assuming allosexuality is also a spectrum, if we say, like, on the far end of the spectrum, an allo person has all of these things in a, in a neat box, they all go together. There are some aces who just don't have that box. <laughs> they don't have any of the things that go in that box. But then, then we've got people in different areas of the spectrum who might be, you know, pulling things a la carte. Like, I might have this, but not that. And just sort of, you know, do it all, do it all piecemeal, you know? Did that make sense? I hope that made sense. I guess the comments will tell. I followed. Hmm. This one might be for you to answer. Do asexuals have wet dreams? So a part of your last discussion, you were men a part of your last answer, you were talking about how the sort of physical manifestation of libido as arousal is something that someone may or may not have. That is less conscious or controllable than I think a lot of people give it credit for. And as far as I'm aware, at least, a wet dream, or I wanted to look up what the more technical term for that was, a nocturnal emission, I feel like that falls under the same category. Here's maybe a, a very ignorant ace brain question. Do wet dreams... is, is that specifically only for people with penises? <laughs> Because I feel like that is the only frame of reference I have ever heard people talk about it in. But while maybe that's more obvious, it seems like it wouldn't be true. I mean, any anything in my life that I've ever heard like, oh, it is it is only this sex that experiences this and not any of the other sexes, I, I realize is bullshit. <laughs> so that seems like something that society has misled me about, but I guess I haven't Googled it. <laughs> It is a thing that anyone can experience. It is not gendered. And I think that it is more talked about. It's mentioned more frequently when boys are growing up, if you're thinking about how, like, split and gendered sex ed is in schools. Yeah. Well, what sex ed? I certainly didn't have <laughs> any sex ed. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, it's kind of like, you know, young girls are at some point in time hopefully before it happens, are told that they may at some point get their first period. Hopefully. And hopefully. <laughs> and so when it happens, you're not confused. And I think that for young boys, it's the same thing of like, this could happen. And not really knowing what's going on or understanding what happened and potentially just waking up with a wet spot in the bed and thinking that you may have wet the bed somehow. Like that, mm. there's a lot of, you know, negative connotations with, you know, hitting puberty and having something like that happen. But I think the reason why it's talked about in a gendered way is due to ejaculation. Yeah, and it, it does give the vibes of, because, I mean, I say I had no sex education. I had a shred of it, and I, I've talked about this in past episodes, but, like, there was definitely a single day where the very binary, they're like, boys go to this room with the one male teacher we have in the entire school, and all the girls go to this room with the school nurse, and we just had, like, a single day that was basically like, you're changing bodies. And past that, the actual health classes were just like, sex is scary because look at all of these photos of the worst possible examples of STDs and STIs and, you know, just scare the hell out of everyone. 
But yeah, it's it's probably as a result of that where it's like I've only heard the phrase wet dreams used in that very specific like young boy coming of age way. So that's interesting, but here's also ignorant ace brain question. Are those always the result of a sex dream? Because that's also what I've always heard is that, well, you have a sex dream and then you have an orgasm while you're sleeping. I don't know any way they could possibly even study that. So even if they say that, that's probably... <laughs> I I pulled up the Wikipedia page for nocturnal emissions while we were talking to just look through this because I have my own experiences, but it's, it's one of those things that I just realized no one ever talked about in detail. Like, <laughs> you know it's a thing, but you don't like go to school and talk with your friends about this stuff and the teachers hardly taught anything so yeah sounds about right from from what i understand some people sleep through them and might not even by the time they wake up remember what the dream is some people wake up during the orgasm mm. which is my experience every time that's happened i've i've woken up i really I, which, interesting, it's always also been, like, I haven't woken up in the middle of the night. It's always been, like, when I was about to wake up anyway. So it's it's really just an internal clock. An internal alarm clock. <laughs> I think, I think it's safe to say that they wouldn't always need to be sex dreams, just because of variability in people. But I think they always have been, in my experience. Mm. See, because that, that's an interesting thing, because if, if a sex dream makes it a lot more likely that this thing is going to happen, there are some aces who have sex dreams. I have never, never once in my life have I had a sex dream. And I know there are some other aces out there that haven't. And in fact, I've also seen questioning aces ask questions like, I don't actually, you know, want to have sex with people. I'm not interested in this, but I have sex dreams. Can I still be asexual if I have sex dreams? So that is a question I've specifically seen. And the answer is yes, of course. If anyone listening happens to be asking that same question. Because then we also can get into more nuanced, variable places in the asexual spectrum where we get into micro labels that don't get outside of aspec communities very often but probably probably the most discussed micro label under asexuality is ego sexuality and there are a lot of people that identify with that because ego sexuality might mean that you can you know enjoy the concept of sex you can still fantasize sometimes this might manifest as watching porn or writing or reading fan fiction or fantasizing about fictional characters or just theoretical situations might be enjoyable even arousing for you but you may have no interest in putting yourself in those situations or participating in them yourself. A lot of people feel that way. So I, I think a lot of people who identify with the label of egosexual have probably been through the process of like, oh God, can I be ace if, <laughs> if I like this situation or I fantasize about this thing? It feels very reminiscent of the question like, can I have a sex dream and still be ace? Like, yes, absolutely you can. But yeah, on, on the other hand, if... If it is a lot less likely for you to have a wet dream, if you do not actually have sex dreams, <laughs> then maybe there are aces out there like me who don't have sex dreams, who don't have wet dreams. So again, it depends. Do asexuals get married? Is this another hi, hello, we are the ace couple? Hi, hello, we are the ace couple. We're going to be celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. <laughs> that is one where... If you don't know all that much about asexual marriage or political implications about asexual marriage, I am going to encourage you to go listen to some of our past episodes. We have added some YouTube playlists over the last couple of weeks, so if that helps you to find episodes of certain topics, we've got an ace politics playlist that talks about some things like how we got married via common law and what that means. And how there are quite literally Republican lawmakers and religious right-wing lobbyists and organizations who are actually trying to make it so that, quote, platonic marriage 
is not legal. In fact, depending on the certain legal frame of reference that you're thinking of, there are some people out there who do legally think that marriage and consummation or a, a sexual relationship is required. They are one in the same thing. You can't separate the two. So we, we've had some, we've had an episode about marriage consummation laws and what that can mean for ace people. And of course, uh, I made a playlist because of, we reference it a lot, our four part series on religious political discrimination against asexuality. That is just its own playlist. So you can go see boom, 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 all four of those episodes in the correct order. Please do listen to them because not only do we get into here are the 83 organizations who are opposed to platonic marriage. Here are their actual religious and political ideologies about marriage. And we get into some of the legal precedent about Obergefell versus Hodges, which legalized same-sex marriage in this country, which is good. And we're glad we have that all over the place. But the steps they took to get that legalized may have actually created more legal complications for things like platonic marriage, for things like polyamorous marriage, for that matter. So please, please do. I hope that piqued your interest. Go listen to those things. Aces can and do get married if they want to, but there are probably more legal complications to it than you probably give it credit for. Do asexuals feel pleasure? Define pleasure? This is one of those ones where I hate that the word pleasure sometimes has a sexual connotation to it because I'm sure that... Most of the people typing that in are using pleasure to mean sexual pleasure. And I don't like that. I also don't like when people use the word intimacy to mean sex. Because there are so many ways to be intimate that aren't sexual. So it's it's one of those, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'd answer, I'd answer this question differently since we're doing the Ace 101 thing. I feel like we've already covered it. Some aces do, some aces don't. <laughs> Like, even when it does come to arousal, when it comes to physical sexual acts, some aces like the way they feel, some aces don't. It's not pleasurable. But that doesn't have to be a bad thing. But the, the, the word pleasure kind of implies good. Yeah, it's, it's a term that one is overloaded and has a lot of definitions, but it is also being narrowed mm -hmm. to mean one specific thing in this instance. And it's also kind of a vague thing. Like, you could get... Sometimes it's hard as an ace to really get deep into these conversations because you have to start talking about things, like, very scientifically, and then people look mm -hmm. at you funny. Yeah. Like... Yes. Like, we talked about kissing earlier, and it's like, that doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't do anything broader for me. Uh, sometimes it's kind of awkward. But if you get into it, like, yes lips do have a higher density of nerve endings than other major parts of the body. And so, yeah, they can be sensitive to touch, and that can feel good sometimes. But there's something different between what I personally am experiencing in that moment and what a lot of allosexual people report to experience in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a thing where, like, if someone in person, like, out in the wild learns, like, oh, you're asexual, and just asks me, like, do you feel pleasure? Like, I, I would absolutely willfully not answer that in the sexual way. I would be like, uh, lots of things in my life bring me pleasure. Yes, I get pleasure when I'm tending to my bonsai. I get pleasure when my spouse and I are taking turns reading a chapter of a novel aloud to one another. I get pleasure when we... When we're painting our toenails, I get pleasure when we're playing video games or board games. <laughs> like, I would just list all the things that bring me pleasure in my life. Uh, because I have a very happy, rich, fulfilled life. I have a million and two hobbies. I have had 842 very fascinating careers <laughs> or jobs in my life. I have weird stories for days that I can pull out. So yeah, I do feel pleasure. I don't feel sexual pleasure, which I think is the undefined, implied question here. But I kind of resent the very notion that this is implied to mean sexual pleasure. Because I don't want that to be the default form of pleasure, or on the hierarchy, the, the highest form of pleasure. 
which a lot of allonormative society does see it as. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to do an intentional subversion of that. Lots of things bring me pleasure. <laughs> what are the things that bring you pleasure, Royce? We've all got a bunch of goofy little hobbies. <laughs> I'm just going to shorten that to hobbies. There are a lot of them and they're changing constantly. Well, we get pleasure from our all ace D&D group. We play D&D every Monday with a group of ace friends. The only horny bards allowed at our table are tieflings. <laughs> All right, I'm flipping the autofill to can asexuals now because I imagine most of these are pretty much the same question, just phrased a different way. But we have a couple of slightly different ones here. Can asexuals fall in love? Yes, hi, hello from the ace couple. <laughs> but can asexuals have crushes? We can, and we might call it that way, but gosh, I feel like it's been so long since I've actually heard people throw around the phrase squish. But that, that used to be a lot more common than it is now, but I still see it from time to time. Some people in the ASPEC community used to try to draw a separation between a crush as what an aloe person would experience when they had a desire to, you know, get closer, or go to the next level, whatever that means with someone. And so some started saying like, well, I don't have a crush, I have a squish. <laughs> And I, I would say that that also, some folks have and do use that also in very different ways. I'd, I'd essentially say a squish is like a platonic crush, but the word platonic can mean slightly different things to different aspects, because there are, there are some people who will only use the word platonic if they think it is implied to be aromantic and asexual. So like that is fully platonic. I know some people who will use the word platonic to only mean asexual. So they could still have a romantic feeling, but if it's not a sexual feeling, they'll still consider that to be platonic, which can be a little confusing because, you know, the allonormative world has an idea of what platonic means. But since we so often conceptualize different types of attraction and different types of affection as being distinctly different or splitting them from one another, you might get some variance in how that's used. But yeah, I like that. A squish. So some, some people might use a squish for, well, I desire a queer platonic relationship with that person. Or they might mean it like a friend crush, like... Maybe this is someone who doesn't want a romantic relationship, doesn't want a QPR, nothing like that, but they have a strong desire to have a really strong bond of friendship with someone. They might call that a squish, so it's like a friend crush. And some people have and do call their queer platonic partners uh, zucchinis. Very, very specific aspect <laughs> word there. If you have a squish on someone, you want them to be your zucchini. <laughs> could be one way to use that word in a sentence. <laughs> Although I feel like zucchini is also going out of fashion. More often, I just hear people say like my QP, like my QP for queer platonic. Some people might say my QPP for my queer platonic partner. And I feel like I see that a lot more often than zucchini, but some people use them interchangeably. Which for anyone curious, there isn't any deeper meaning to the word zucchini being used in that context. It kind of caught on just because of its absurdity. It was a random word that was used to describe something that is difficult to describe. It's really cute. I also like, um, cause if you think of all the like pet names that are like really common, like aloe go-tos, you have like honey and sugar and, and we're just like, nah, vegetable. <laughs> Silly, silly, silly little insights to a spec culture. Well, that's probably enough Google for today. Before we end, Courtney, do you want to explain to everyone why, why you were trolling Chicago earlier? <laughs> there was a Reddit user, and this was so funny, and we all had so much fun with this that it even got to us who are, are not... Reddit users, we don't have a Reddit account, but these got like screenshotted, shared around all kinds of A circles. <laughs> there was a Reddit user called Alfredo Sauce on who just went to like presumably all of the major just like asking questions subreddits and asked the same question over and over and over again. They just asked to like r slash ask Reddit, r slash questions, r slash ask. Do asexuals like Chicago pizza? 
And they was this was just the funniest thing. So of course these screenshots are getting shared around. People are debating whether or not Ace is like Chicago pizza. But then then they switched tactics. I think they actually started going on to some Ace subreddits and then asking like asexuals of Reddit, do you like Chicago pizza? <laughs> And it's it's just nonsense. Actually, like going there, you'd also see people who would like tag this user and be like, well, any progress? Do asexuals like Chicago pizza? And they'd just respond, I don't know anymore. <laughs> just silly nonsense things. And it appears that this user's last actual post, not talking about comments necessarily, was the asexuals don't like Chicago pizza, so I got them Portillo's instead, with a photo of just like an empty food container. And so I, I guess that's the answer. Asexuals don't like Chicago pizza. And honestly, why would we? It's the worst kind of pizza. But uh, that thing about the garlic bread that I said, I, I, I have to correct the misinformation. The garlic bread absolutely is a thing. Do aces like garlic bread? It's become one of our newer community food symbols, but it's sort of an extension of our one of our oldest community symbols, which has been cake. I wrote an article about the history of cake in the Ace community for Bon Appetit, so I will link that in the show notes if you want to read it. And it does give a little nod to a more recent iteration of that where garlic bread was brought in, but essentially with the same, like, cake is better than sex, garlic bread is better than sex kind of a thing. So we'll also very likely do a full episode talking more about the history of cake in the ace community. And we might even just do a general episode with a bunch of different ace community symbols and just little ace culture things. So many things we can talk about. So little time. But it's okay. We release an episode every single Wednesday, so... We'll get there eventually. We have the time. So if you all made it here this far, please go ahead and give us a like, comment, subscribe, rating, review, five stars, whatever it is you do on whatever platform it is that you are consuming us on. Consuming us on. Oh, that sounded terrible. Why did I say that? Don't, don't, don't consume us. And don't consume Chicago pizza. Goodbye.